The PJ Flex Show is presented by Window Concepts and Affinity Plus Federal Credit Union. Our how is everything. How you do something matters. Culture, how, next time mentality. That better be first. The PJ Flex Show starts now. Welcome in, everybody, to the final regular season edition of the P.J. Fleck Show. Joined, as always, by the head coach of Gopher football, P.J. Fleck, alongside former Gophers wide receiver Ron Johnson, KFAN's Justin Gard. I'm Pierre Nugent. The drone is inoperable today, so sorry if, uh, for everybody who was tuning in for that, but we'll ha hopefully have it back up and running when next season rolls around. But before we look ahead this week, P.J., we need to take a quick look back. It was a hard fought game between yeah. you and Penn State. I mean, the, the margin of victory, as they say, razor thin. You fall just a point short. What was the mood like in the locker room after the game? And what has it been like since the game, knowing that you guys were so close to victory against Penn State? Well, the locker room reminded me of Michigan. I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in there. This, this team cares so much. Uh, and caring can take you pretty far because it really reflects how hard you play. And our guys play so hard. It came down to a few plays here and there. Uh, we lost the turnover margin. Uh, we missed a few tackles late. Um, they were able to, to run out the clock with three fourth downs in the fourth quarter. And, and that's really the story of the game. Now, there's a lot of decisions that are made that James Franklin doesn't get some of those decisions. It's a tough, tough, um, tough press conference. We don't get some of those. It's a tough press conference. It's, uh, it's one of those things that you just, it's a championship bout, championship fight. I thought our guys played really hard, really well. And uh, I, I can't fault them for that. And that's all you can ask out of your football team. They give you everything they have. And I, I know our players drained the tank. I mean, they did everything they possibly could. Yeah, and coaches have to live and die by their decisions. And, you know, in, in a situation at the end of the game, James Franklin, you know, probably had some kind of call on. Yep. Uh, punt save versus, you know, going after a punt. They get the fake punt. What in that decision or whatever, what was the thought process through there? Well, either way, if he wants to fake it, it's going to be hard to stop that particular play, uh, whether that's punt safe, whether that's punt return, whether that's punt block. You still have things built in to execute and stop a fake. Mm -hmm. We didn't execute it well enough. I've got to be able to do better at coaching it. Um, but those are decisions that if you don't make that, that's something that that's a huge risk, right? And then they get two more fourth downs on top of that. We still had a chance to overcome that. And that's just a huge call on their part. We block an extra point. We return it for two points. We block a, a punt. Those are calls that you're going to have to make. And um, those are tough calls. We still have to execute it, though. I'm not here to get you fined on the P.J. Flex show, but there, oh, was, a, there was a call before <laughs> the half after we just saw that wonderful trick play right after the blocked punt. Penn State's going down the field. There's a pass interference call. It looks a little iffy to most of us on this panel. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you agree with that. You don't need to say that and get fined. I think it's 25 grand. But when something like that happens, we've gone over this with like the Michigan play or something happens where you think there's been a mistake made. Remind people kind of what the after game process is. If you send stuff in, if you talk to the Big Ten, how all that stuff goes. Yeah, so there's a process. You fill out a form and you put the calls that you really want challenged down uh, and that you have a question on. And you're looking for just, sometimes you're looking just for education uh, you know why was this called what's the rule on this now you know all those pretty much <laughs> handing those in or you wouldn't actually turn them in uh, but at the end of the day I mean they're gonna make the calls that they're gonna make you have a chance to be able to turn those in they come back and say yes I agree or I disagree so basically I agree with what you're saying or I disagree with your saying and and uh, you know I won't tell you what they actually said oh that's a big this, build you could probably assume yeah <laughs> I think I think several of us can assume no doubt about it Going back to the fourth quarter, uh, you had a second and goal call. Ariante Ursary was going to be a receiver on that play. How do you balance the element of surprise and putting the ball in the hands of your traditional playmakers in that essence? What was the goal in that play call specifically? Was it try to catch him off guard? Well, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's why you call it. Uh, now, again, we don't execute it very well. They drop an end, uh, and, and they hadn't shown that on film in that particular coverage. Max does a great job throwing it away. We score on a trick play, a, a double reverse pass right in the first that half. everybody thinks is a great call. This is a terrible call because it doesn't work. <laughs> but if it worked, it would have been another great call, and big fella would have run into the end zone. Uh, but those are things that you have – that you're going to call at the perfect situation. Now, it didn't work, so everybody's like, well, that's a really bad call. Well, if I didn't, if I knew that it wasn't going to work, I wouldn't have called it. We spent two weeks on that play, looked really good in practice. We got the exact look we wanted. Now, again, they did something that they hadn't shown, and it didn't work, and Max threw it away. This is one of the best defenses in the country inside the 10-yard line. Okay, we had the ball at the 9-yard line. 
We get one yard on first down. So we can sit there and say, okay, we're going to drop back a pass, but now there's sack fumble possibilities. We run a trick play we don't get, and then we don't get it on third down, and we still get points. So to me, I mean, those are things that you have to be able to go over, but we score a touchdown who's wide open on a trick play, and we ran two trick plays out of the entire 60-some plays we actually ran, and, and uh, unfortunately, one didn't work. Does Tay have good hands? I've never seen, like, when you see, you see it in practice, so I don't know. I've never seen him catch up. Does he have great hands? Oh, tremendous hands. Pillows. Okay, uh, all right. <laughs> pillow, big pillows. Uh, and he is one of the most athletic people you've ever met. So if he caught that, he was going to score. Uh, he looked great in practice doing it. He was really excited about when it was called. You know that's coming. That's not just a random call. You know, sure. hey, when we get put in that position, from what we saw on film, what we've practiced, this is a really good call. Got the look. They happened to do something they didn't necessarily show. Didn't work. It did not cost us a game. That's one play that just didn't work. It's like running inside zone that didn't work. So I, I don't know why people talk about that one play when the other trick play scored, and that's why we got seven points. And you returned to PAT, blocked a punt. Uh, special teams coordinators don't always get, you know, the pat on the back. They always get the, hey, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? But what allowed them to be so locked in on those phases? I know the players have to make the plays, but the coach also has to make those calls to actually say, hey, we're going to go after the punt here, or hey, this is what you, I've seen this, you can get this PAT. I mean, well, you get what you emphasize, and I think what was really, really cool was that what we talked about we had to do against them on the pump block team, we did. Uh, the only thing we didn't do well that day was we, we didn't stop a fake, right? And if I knew he was going to fake it, then everybody in the building would have known he was going to fake it. We would have had a specific call and not even had a returner back there, right? So you don't know those things. Those are the elements of surprise. But our guys, the, the first thing I do when I look at an opponent is I watch the field goal block team of that team. And I watch 10 plays. And I watch different games. And I watch it at different parts of the game. I want to see how hard that team plays when they're getting beat, blown out, when they're winning by a lot or the start of the game and the end of the game when it's close. Our field goal block team plays like this all the time. And that's what our team does. That's the DNA of our team. How hard they play, how tough they play. They're ready for this to happen. This has only happened one time this year. We've been close a lot. It only happened one time and they were there opportunistic, ready, not like surprised by it. They were ready and expected it, even though it's the first time it's happened in 11 games. So with your defense, uh, their quarterback, Drew Aller, I think kind of ended statistically with what he usually is in terms of passing percentage and everything that comes with it. But it seemed like especially in the first half, you kind of had him off his game, not as accurate, got to him a couple of times. Yeah. Defense played well uh, for much of that game. What did you see from that side? Yeah, I thought we played incredibly, incredibly hard on defense. I thought we were able to get pressure on him, even with four. I thought when we did bring blitzing, we were able to condense the pocket. There are times in the second half when he does escape, we run by him. Yeah. Instead of shrinking the pocket and going to the level of the quarterback, we kind of go rogue and go by them. And those are the things that the discipline comes into play later in the game. And we're doing it really well in the first half. I didn't think we did as well in the second half. Um, but he's a really good quarterback. I mean, that's well documented. He's a really good player. He's got weapons around him everywhere, a great run game, the tight end, really good offensive line. But I thought we were able to condense that pocket, get him uncomfortable. But I thought we let him escape a little bit too much in the second half. Cody Lindenberg is a name that we haven't talked about much this season, which is kind of surprising considering how great he plays on the field. Back-to-back -back games with 14 total tackles. How gratifying has it been for you to see him? Uh, injury plague season last year. Didn't have the type of season that he wanted last year to come back this year and have the type of success he's having this season. I think he's one of the best players in the conference. Uh, I've always believed that. I mean, he is a, he used to be a skinny, long kid from Anoka, Minnesota. And I remember watching his workout and looking at him at camp. And, uh, you know, we were, his, we were his only offer. And he dreamed of being on the Gopher football team and dreamed of playing for the University of Minnesota. And it's showing on senior day as he played Penn State. I mean, uh, he is one of the most productive linebackers. He, there's not many 6'3", 240-pounders that can run, cover, hit, do all of it. He reminds me a lot of Blake Cashman, but just bigger and longer. He plays the game really sudden, really fast, makes great decisions. He, 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 uh, he can make his decisions really quickly. Uh, he can diagnose and read defenses pretty quickly. So, I mean, this is a, a really good football player, and I hope we have him for years to come. But if he makes a decision to come out, that's great too, and we're going to support him whatever he decides. And speaking of whether you stay or go or whatever, the senior day, yep. what was that like, and what do you want people to remember these, this group of seniors by? Well, I think this, this senior class was really, really consistent. You know, and when you look at where they were to where they are now and what they went through, uh, some guys were here and recruited during the 2020 season. I mean, Justin Wally, who's going to join us here, I mean, 
Justin Wally never saw Minnesota. Yeah. He never visited Minnesota. He never met me in person and <laughs> believed in what we were doing with all the SEC and ACC offers he had from Mississippi. He decided to come up here. So this class was really consistent in shaping Minnesota football from what we are right now and produced a ton of wins and a ton of uh, memorable moments for us. Yeah, it's certainly been a very special class, a, best, a very special senior class at that. And like PJ just mentioned, when we come back here on the PJ Flex Show, we're going to be joined by Justin Wally. We'll get his thoughts on what it's going to take to knock off Wisconsin later this week and stay with us here on the PJ Flex Show. watching the PJ Flex Show. Welcome back into the PJ Flex Show, everybody. Joined now by a veteran on the back end of the defense, cornerback Justin Wally joining us on set. Justin, great to see you. Thanks for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Let's take a look back real quick to Penn State. You guys fought tooth and nail in that game. What was it like playing in the game first and foremost? And what was your message as a leader on the team what was your message to the team after falling just short against Penn State? Well, just playing the game was an awesome opportunity. You know, playing the number four team in the country, your last game in, in the stadium, and it's just an amazing feeling just to be out there with my brothers one last time. But my message was the guys just to just have fun and just execute at the highest level as possible. And the outcome wasn't what we wanted it to, but just having fun with the guys is just the most important part. You've had some big moments this season, you know, interceptions, everything. But battling back from injury, sometimes that can be mentally taxing as well as physically. Talk us through that. Like, what was that like trying to get back on the field? Oh, well, it's just a huge part to our training staff. I know Sip, Katie, and Ash, they did a wonderful job with me. Every morning, I'm in there early working on my knees. So <laughs> it, was, it was a struggle. But And then I also think it was a very good lesson for me. I know being off the field it really makes you realize how – much you love playing football because I've never missed a game for my life. Wow. So just not being able to play really just made me more grateful for the opportunity that I had. And when I got back out there, it just opened my eyes even bigger. What are some of the things you need to do? Like you said, you've never missed a game before. What are some of the things you do to try to keep yourself grounded and sane, knowing that you want to be out there, but you can't? Well, I was just doing my best on the sideline, you know, giving out tips, doing everything I can to help the guys on the field play their best. PJ, we've talked so much about this young man yep. uh, over the years. Just a knack for being around the football. What type of difference does he make when he's healthy and he's on the field for you guys? Oh, he's an immediate impact player. He has been since he arrived on campus as a true freshman. Part of the reason he's not coming back is he's used all his eligibility. <laughs> yeah. We used it way too quick on him. Uh, but it, that's he, I always tell the NFL scouts that he's one of the top five, top ten best football players I've ever coached. I mean, at any position, because he could play any position. And he's been incredibly productive since he's walked through the door. And that's very difficult to do. Sure. Uh, I still remember his pick against Wisconsin his freshman year. And it seems like it was yesterday. And here he is, you know, um, you know playing in his last regular season game. But, um, you know, one thing about him is I always tell him he's not the biggest, not the longest, you know, but I would never want to play against him. Because he's got a really short memory and a ton of confidence. And when you combine those two things, he's unstoppable. And I'm just uh, really proud of of what he, the type of man he's become and the type of player he is. And getting ready to play Wisconsin, this is what I think everybody who's been here for a number of years understands how important these games can be and how fun they are. But you've had a chance, and I got a chance to sit down with Daniel Jackson earlier this season. He talked about how you made him better, how you challenged him. So when he got in the games, he's like, oh, this is easy. How has he made you better? Well, ever since I've been on campus, we've been going at it. I know this past <laughs> spring ball in camp, every day I'm looking, I'm just looking for, I'm like, if I can cover D-Jack, I can cover anybody in the country. And just a testament to how good he is and how hard he works. And just going at each other every day made both of us better players. And you got a brother that plays football. How often do you two go at it? Not, as, not too much anymore. <laughs> but when we were little and in high school, it was every day. I remember it was my sophomore year of high school. I locked him up like four times straight into practice, and that's when I kind of started feeling myself. I knew I was pretty good then. <laughs> Justin, you mentioned it being, it, we just had senior day, you know, at the Penn State game. That was senior day. You get an opportunity to play in your, in your last game at Huntington Bank Stadium. What were the emotions like for you, you know, before the game and, and after the game? I have to imagine it's a pretty unique situation. It is. It's, it was a lot. I know I try to keep my attention on the game, but my emotions kept getting the best of me most of the time. You just, it's just a wonderful place to play. All the fans are amazing. Then just 
one last chance with your brothers to go out there. It was a surreal experience. Like the outcome wasn't what it, we wanted it to be, but I just enjoyed playing my brothers one last time. And coach, you had a viral moment this year where you came to bat for your players when the refs threw a flag on them uh, for what we all know is a normal celebration. Don't get them fined now. But, but, what, but how important is it for you, for these players when they leave to know like, you know, no matter what I do, no matter good or bad, how well I play, coach Fleck has my back. Yeah, I always have these guys back. I mean, we're all going to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Um, this is a learning environment. If we're talking about developmental program, then it's academically, athletically, socially, spiritually in your entire life. And I always tell these guys, I want your whole life to matter. Uh, and we're, we're doing a whole turkey drive here in game week of Wisconsin. And everybody's asking me, like, why would you do that Wisconsin week? Because there's more important things in life, like 500 families in need, yeah. than just winning or losing a football game. Now, it's really important to win, and I get that. But you win after you become a winner and he's a winner and he's a winner in everything he does doesn't mean we don't make mistakes it doesn't mean that we're we're perfect and it's our job as educators and teachers and mentors to do what we can for the four year four, four or five years that they're here and hopefully they take those things they've learned and apply them to the families they don't even have yet the kids they don't even have yet the communities they're not even living in yet and they can go in and use those habits that they have and go be the best men that they want to be. Has that resonated with you, Justin? That message, that overall program message, how has that resonated with you? Yeah, because since I've been here, we've always been doing things for the community, for other people. And I've just grown so much more as a, as a man since I've been here from, because growing up, I didn't really, I wasn't really big into the community, but just seeing how much that affects other people's lives really brings joy into my personal life. Sure, no doubt about it. Well, Justin, we certainly appreciate you taking the time. Good luck against Wisconsin. We're so we're gonna miss you around here, He's man. A but, one, yeah, we're sure. gonna miss you around here. But congratulations on the, your entire career here at Minnesota. We're gonna miss you. Thank you. All right, we're coming up more, plenty more here on the PJ Flex Show. When we come back, we'll take a look across enemy lines and look ahead to this Friday's game against Wisconsin's the battle for the X. We'll talk about it more next on the PJ Flex Show. To the PJ Flex Show. Welcome back into the PJ Flex Show, everybody. I don't think I need to say much more than Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's the biggest game of the year every year. PJ, tell us a little bit about how deep this rivalry goes with this program and what it's going to take to try to get a victory this Friday in Madison. Yeah, it's the longest standing rivalry in college football. 1890. It's 63, 62, and eight. And Wisconsin's <laughs> got a one-game advantage on us. That that. I'm just humbled and appreciative to be a part of the rivalry every year. Uh, it's something really special. And growing up, I didn't know much about it. Being from Chicago, I mean, you don't hear much about it. You, you hear about your local news, right? And that was always Northwestern Illinois. That was big around where I was. But you talk about one of the greatest rivalries in all college football. And all the records go out the window. How you played last week goes out the window. And uh, you do everything you can to find a way to win that axe. And when you look at the running backs you guys have faced this year, you've already faced a bunch in, in uh, Caleb Johnson and so on and so forth. Now you have another one in Walker. How much of a focal point does he become this week, or is it kind of like a, we got to take a holistic approach to this offense? Well, they got two. I got two really big, uh, really good backs. Three wideouts that are really explosive. I mean, you look at their backs. I mean, 13 is the freshman they brought in, and he's really explosive and he's powerful. And you can see he's going to have a bright future there. Number three is a guy they brought in from Oklahoma who Marcus Major knows as well. Uh, they're very productive in the run game. Their gap schemes are really, really good and sound. I mean, they are big up front, athletic. They rip off yards left and right, and they'll, they'll hurt you so fast in the explosive pass game. If you look at the Nebraska game last week, they score points in chunks and in a hurry, right? And, of course, they don't win the, the, the game, but the score doesn't really show how close that game was and how many explosive plays the Badgers had. We don't know when our next PJ Flex show is going to be this year, so we'll ask you to get reflective in our final couple mm. of minutes. The story of this team in your mind as you've gone through now these 11, almost 12 games, going all the way back to January, what stands out or what, what do you hope the story is about this group? Oh, they're just a ton of overachievers. I mean, they're a team that really came together and connected uh, in a world where you're adding 50 to 60 players a year, which is very different than it used to be. I mean, you're turning over almost half your roster in the new world of college football. And to get these guys to be a team, that's really difficult to do. You can see that's really hard. People have a lot of skill and talent, but can you make them a team? This team helped make themselves a great team. And again, we've lost you know, four one-possession games. We won three one-possession games. This team is good enough to do whatever they wanted to do and what we earned. Um, 
But I, this team being connected was really, really special. And that started with the quarterback, Max Brosmer, and what he was able to do with them in the offseason and really have an open mind to come in here and really connect the team from the start. So I, I hope everybody appreciates just the type of team they are, how hard they play, how consistent they play with that effort, because they are a fun team to watch, and they're a fun team to coach. And more people compliment how fun they are to watch, win or lose. And again, our job is to hopefully win way more than we lose, but they're fun to watch play. And what a great compliment uh, from other people when they watch our team. Yeah, in the college football era where you see players now, if we're not going to the championship, I'm going to sit out the rest of the season or, you know, I'm going to transfer because how do you continue to keep these guys as a, you know, we over me type of attitude? Because it seems like none of them really bring that up ever. Well, there's a difference between uh, contributing and being fully committed. There's a difference between those two things. And I think this team has been committed since day one. They're more committed now than they've ever been. And they understand what that word commitment means to each other. You know, some people do things for the trophy or for the result or for something that they can't control. You can control doing something for one another, and they do that. And that, that's a special, special trait to have as a team. About 30 seconds left here. Plans for Thanksgiving. You guys play the day after, so what's the plan for Thanksgiving? <laughs> Uh, well, we, we, we drive to Madison on the bus. <laughs> on Thanksgiving Day? On Thanksgiving Day. So we'll be really grateful <laughs> for our bus ride. I'm sure we'll have, like, you know, Charlie Brown Thanksgiving going on or something like that on the, on the screens. But I'm just kidding. I don't think we'll have that. <laughs> but uh, we'll have a thanks, Thanksgiving tree. Day meal yeah. on, on Wednesday for them, and we'll celebrate that. Turkey Drive's a huge piece of that, the Row the Boat Turkey Drive, thanks to Cub Food and all they do. And, yeah, that's how we'll do it. Home Alone. Put that on the TV. Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll yeah. find all of them. Yeah. It's a little more Christmas. But, yes, it's Thanksgiving, too. PJ, we appreciate you you all season long here on the PJ Flex Show. We appreciate, appreciate you. you at home watching all season long on the PJ Flex Show. Don't forget, special time for the Gopher pregame show Friday, not Saturday this week. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We'll see you this Friday on the Gopher pregame show.